we'd like to thank you for joining us for another episode of Looking to Jesus. My name is John Hines, preach for the Church of Christ in North Ridgeville, Ohio. My co-host is... Daniel Sanders, preacher for the Quail Valley Church of Christ, Batesville, Arkansas. Our address is 4104 Harrison Street, Batesville, Arkansas. And our website is org. Our website, I guess, since we're giving our digits out, nrcoc.net, here for the church. And uh, we meet at, what? what is it, 36364, I think, is the physical address where we meet. It's next door, wherever it is. Just find me and then look next door and... <laughs> There you go. <laughs> just, you're just gonna stand out there and wave and once people see you yeah that's even, right that's even right though we don't do video so they don't know what you look like <laughs> <laughs> get on the web you. get on the website we got everything on the website nrcoc.net okay daniel what are we talking about this week uh, i think we're we were gonna go into talking about the social gospel this week we talked last week about the function of the church where we were or not the function, but the organization of the church, uh, addressing things about, you know, different things within the church of the, the elders and deacons and preachers as well, talking about how God set things in order for us today. And then we were talking about some things there in the New Testament as well, things that were in existence, things that were operational at one point but had also uh, no longer needed for some of those works. So we were talking about some of that last week. And now as we look at the organization of the church, kind of the organization of the church part two, where it talks about some of the things when it comes to what the church is to focus on or the function of the church and what we need to do to try to help others be drawn to the, be drawn into the church. There's so many different speculations of things of people thinking, we need to offer this or that. And so now we've seen the development of the social gospel, something that has been in in the in in play for decades, uh, generations, really. But within the church in the last 60 years, it has become and maybe a little bit longer than 60, maybe we're talking 60 to 80 year realm, where we've seen uh, the institutional churches and different things trying to promote things. And there has been a uh, divide over such things within the church as well talking about the social gospel. All right. So I'd like to back up for a second. Talk to me about the function of the church. What is the function of the church? What is the work of the church? So work of the church, we focus on evangelism. Okay. Uh, we talk what about is evangelism? It is it is the, the proclamation, the preaching of the word. Okay. It's to be able to share the good news, the gospel message with others. Okay. Because of what Jesus has done in giving his life. We share that message and preach that word. We use word preaching as well, uh, talking about evangelism. Okay. Uh, another function of the church is we talk about edification, the building up of the church, where we, we talk about the teaching side of it. Not only do we see there's a difference, there's differences between preaching and teaching where you, pr you proclaim the good news. Now you're teaching the word to be able to help cultivate what you're preaching and teaching and help build up, root up, uh, create good solid foundations within an individual and being able to build each other up towards that hope and process. That way the church can be able to focus on reaching out to the world and being able to understand more of God's word through teaching the word. Okay. And then also uh, the idea of benevolence, charitable type action where we help out needy saints that are in need from time to time and being able to address certain things when someone may be in need uh, of financial assistance or whatever be to help them in in these different circumstances helping out christians uh, that's the, the you know think about the three uh, foundational points of the functions of the church i think it kind of falls in those three in those three for the most part okay so now when we we talk about the social gospel why does the social gospel not fall under the umbrella of benevolence and, and what and, and even before that really if you could what is the social gospel? What sort of things are we really talking about? Uh, we're talking about things like uh, uh, you want d d def definitive definitions like food, eating, having having a believing that we need to have a common meal together to draw people in. We need to be able to have food. I mean, uh, there's that. There's the idea. We could also talk about uh, instrumental music uh, kind of being incorporated within the church. 
uh, some different programs that people are trying to use. I know some around here that we're that I see people are get, dealing with right now are uh, the 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 quote unquote trunk or treat things. Oh, I do uh, like candy. I do like my candy too. If, if they have Reese's peanut butter pumpkins, you better watch out. I might be coming. Up. No, <laughs> but we're talking about, of but, course, church funded church programs funded. exactly and and yeah. so now we're getting now we're after halloween now we're getting into november and december brings into people believing in the christmas programs and not only are we just talking about those types of things but then we talk about uh church funded orphanages uh you could start getting into does a church need to fund colleges and educational systems does it, uh, you know, talking about outside the realm of, you know, Bible teaching. I mean, we have our own classes within our confines of our church, but does a church need to go and fund a college or a church need to fund orphanages, nursing homes, hospitals? We start getting into some of those things. And that's where we see some of the denominational world begins to look at this. And then also even churches looking at trying to promote those things. We've had, we've had certain things happening with the hurricanes lately where people are wanting to kind of make a centralized location Churches want to take the lead role in, in, hey, you send your donations here, you send this here, and we'll be able to take care of it, collect it together, and then send it over. Uh, and making it almost like a staple, making it like a requirement that this is what the church is to be involved with. That that this is the, the primary focus, and this is part of that. They start using the words of ministry and using that in all these different aspects uh, and trying to say that's in the sake of, in the honor of ministry. All right, so when we talk about social, the social gospel, that that term started being used because what brethren were wanting to do was they were wanting to introduce and push social reforms. Yes. That the church was responsible for these social reforms. And so people started wanting to make the church a one stop shop for everything. Yep. Like I said, whether it is secular education, we're not talking about biblical education. We're talking about secular education, right? Or whether we're talking about healthcare, physical healthcare, or whether we're talking about, you know, daycares, things like that, or we're just simply talking about food and entertainment. Yeah. And it is your, you know, these, these social programs introduced for, for social like I said, social reform. And one of, one of the things we need to, to think about, you know, you, in speaking about benevolence, we recognize, or, or one of the things we need to recognize is who is the church authorized to care for? And I always try to get people to understand they need to recognize the distinction between being in the church and out of the church. If you get all of the perks of being a member of the church, but you don't have to be a member, I mean, this is, you know, this is somewhat of a tried analogy, Daniel, you know, Netflix, if you got Netflix for free, would you ever subscribe to Netflix? No. So you would not be a member of Netflix if you already got Netflix for free. <laughs> and it's like, why would yeah. you ever be a member of the Lord's church if you get all the benefits of being a member of the Lord's church without being a member? Yeah. Like you need to you need to actually be a member of the church. You need to follow the Lord. And uh, there's a there's needs to be a a discerning recognition between being in the kingdom and out of the kingdom, from being a believer to an unbeliever. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So one thing we might ask real quickly. So does the Bible authorize all those social programs? Do we see those things in scripture? And however you want to answer that, Daniel, go for it. Which which one of those think, programs do you want to deal with? Well, you know, well, we can talk. We are going to touch base with several, but you look at the scripture, and there is some talking about some of these different issues, uh, some of the different things. Uh, so we talk about the the food, the the, the meals, and and the inter, you know, talking about that that form of entertainment. Uh, the Bible speaks about it on a few different uh, ways. Is uh, is it an act of worship or ministry? Well, you know, for instance, First Corinthians eleven. You know, you have the there in in the, in the text there in First Corinthians eleven, where it talks about the the Lord's Supper and how Paul was addressing how the church had made it a 
I mean, we've talked about this in recent weeks and how they had come together. They were sitting there getting their belly full. One was, you know, some people were hungry. Another person was drunk. And, and so they were making it more of a meal than anything else. And what does Paul say in verse 22 of 1 Corinthians 11? He says, what do you not have houses to eat in and houses to drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. So, you know, we begin all thinking about some things here in this in this text here. The church had come together. They had worshipped or had come together to worship, but then they were making things more common than anything else and just making this a meal. And Paul was condemning such actions. But it's interesting to note that if you're coming together to eat, you know, if you're just coming together to get your belly full, why don't you just do that at home? And that's, I mean, verse 34, if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. It, it it's is. not wrong to be hungry. Um, right. The, the Lord understands, you know, when he says, don't worry about what you eat, what you drink, what you wear. After all these things, the Gentiles seek. And he says, your heavenly father knows you need these things. They are necessities, but there's a place for them. There's a place for them. That's exactly right. Is that... There's a time and place for them. Is it the is it the role of the church to be able to physically fill our stomachs up? The answer is no. But well, you have another the, you have another passage, John six. I, I don't know if that's where you were going next, but I, I'd like to go to John two first to make a okay. point. Okay, yeah. But let's let's come back to John chapter two. This is something that the Lord does more than once in His ministry. It looks like He does it at the beginning of His ministry and at the end. In John chapter two. It's the cleansing of the temple, and he goes up to the temple in Jerusalem. He finds in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves. He makes a whip out of cords, and he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make, do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. And I always like to make the point, the temple is going to be destroyed in 70 AD. Right. right. So it's like, why are you worrying about cleansing the temple when it's already slated for destruction? It's because he's laying down a principle that some things do not belong in the house of God. And when he does this and you see what come, he cleanses the temple. And then in the parallel accounts or in the other accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you see what comes in because all of a sudden the blind and the lame are coming in. Right. He's teaching them in the temple. There, There's teaching and there's praising and it's like God's house became what it needed to be. Now, granted, he's healing people as well, but does that mean he wanted the Lord's does that mean he wanted the Lord's house to turn into a physical hospital? No, the miracles were meant to confirm the teaching is is what was going on. But just from this passage, you can show there are some things that do not belong in the house of God. So when voices today want the church to become a one stop shop. For all things, including entertainment and you name it, whatever else. It's like, no, there are some things that did not belong in the house of God. In Mark's account, he actually kept those who were carrying, he, he's, there were those who were carrying their wares through the temple and he stops yeah. them. They were simply treating the temple in a common manner. And you use that word a little bit ago. And it's like, that's the problem when people treat the house of God, like it's just, it's common yeah. and anything goes and, and it starts becoming more about us and less about God. And that's where the issue comes in is that we have made it more of what we want rather than what God wants. And that's yeah. where we create problems for ourselves. We create that hindrance ourselves. We're not doing what God wants. And so we're also, again, going back to what we were talking about last week, we're not, allowing Jesus to be the head of the church because we want to uh, infiltrate our own thoughts and ideas and practices and believe that they are gospel. That's exactly right. what the Pharisees were doing when they promoted their tradition. I'm not saying it's the same thing, but the same mentality that the Pharisees, they put their traditions above God. We're putting our own desires for this social gospel above God and his will, and we're replacing it and thinking that it is necessary 
and and needed. Let me ask you something, Daniel. Something occurred to me just as you said that. There are two lines of thought that are both wrong. One, you have you have certain this mentality like the Pharisees where it's just traditionalism and you're just going through the motions, right? And it um you might associate it with certain denominations um that are more and this is not my phrase high church um where it's very traditional very ritualistic yeah right so thinking of of those sorts of denominations and they've elevated tradition but then you have these these other churches where it's it's more like a concert it's more like a, a cafeteria and a concert and it's anything goes yeah they're both wrong but it's like opposite ends of the spectrum right one is nothing but ritual, and the other one is nothing but entertainment. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One, one that is tradition with everything, and the other is breaking the cycle of tradition. Now, now to your point about they're both they both have something common though. It's what are their desires, and it's just one wants this and one wants that. And yeah. what we have to ask ourselves is. What does the Lord desire? You know, we don't get to say, well, I want to find a church that suits me. Right. It's like, no, I want to do what the Lord wants me to do. Right. He's and the head know, of the church. We always we we hear the arguments, and I've seen them, I've seen them before. Someone's made this, someone's made this comment, so it's not coming from me in particular, but people say, Well, we well, there's contemporary, there's the traditional uh worship type. I want the scriptural type. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Let's come up to John 6 now. Okay. Uh, in John chapter 6, you have the feeding of the 5,000. The following day, there are those who, they're looking for more food. And they confront Jesus. And Jesus says, this is John 6, verse 26. Most assuredly, I say to, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. What are we what are we looking for? What are we and, and by the way, there are a lot of these people who are going to depart from Jesus and not follow him anymore in verse 66. Yeah. If Jesus wanted to retain these people, all he had to do was fix more bread and fish. And they would have stayed. They would have stayed. Yeah. And so the question has to be asked. Why did he not make more bread and fish? It's because he's wanting them to labor for the food that does not perish. There's a better and, reason to come. Yeah. Oh. And a lot of people would have had him engage in the social gospel. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know, you want them to follow you, so give them what they want. And it's like, no, that's that's not what not what the Lord did. Um, I want to let, let's come up to Acts two now. Okay. In Acts chapter two, as the church is beginning, and and what what I want to think about, because we do believe in benevolence, yes, but we have to deal with certain issues, and one of the issues is, does that mean the church is, the church should be responsible for those outside of the church? That's one of the questions that has to be dealt with. Can't talk about that just for a moment. I just have yeah, just an ahead. example to kind of explain. I, this is just recent that I had a friend of mine uh, is going was going through some of this. They had a person that had passed away, okay. and so they had asked if they could be able to do the funeral at the church building. Okay, no problem. You know, if they, you know, be able to do this for 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 them. Okay. Well, then it came time for the meal, and there were some people that that were uh, a little hesitant about wanting to do the meal. But then the argument for some of these family members was was that the church needed to provide the meal and then called it an act of benevolence. And you know, trying to trying to ponder on that, it's just kind of, is this an act of benevolence? No, it's not. It's not an act of benevolence because these people were able to provide food for themselves. They had no issue with that. Uh, we're talking about matters of hospitality, maybe, but. People trying to just uh, what I'm getting at is that there's this thought process even of people trying to justify or trying to uh, acknowledge and calling you know being able to feed one another and the church feeding another 
trying to put it into the act of benevolence. I don't know if you ever came across something like that or people trying to justify it in that manner before, John. Oh, I, yeah. And they, they try to try to put it under that umbrella. I'm, I'm looking up one of the places I want to see. Okay. I just wanted to look up what the word benevolence literally meant, but it didn't help me too much. But anyway, here in Acts chapter 2, so, so when we talk about benevolence, and not not to sound churchy, and I don't mean this to sound churchy, but people talk about general benevolence or limited benevolence. Now, what that means is, should the church provide benevolence for anybody and everybody, or is the church to take care of the members of the church? Okay, so in Acts chapter 2, as the church was beginning, it says in verse 44, now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Now, the who it's speaking about are all who believed. It's talking about the Christians. Yeah. That's who it's talking about. So they are seeing to the needs of the church. This is how the members are being cared for. There are needy saints. Yeah. That's what we see. Now, we do see unbelievers being spoken about. Oh, let's see. That's verse verse 40. Oh, where does it talk about? Yeah, verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. That may be talking about beyond the church. There's a reason people were becoming Christians. <laughs> there, there's a reason that people were obeying the gospel. And it's right. like there's a distinction between believers and unbelievers like we've, we've already pointed out, but here they divided them among, among all as anyone had need talking about believers. You see the same thing over in chapter four In chapter four at yeah. verse 34, nor was there anyone among them talking about the church who lacked for all who were possessors of lands and houses sold them. They brought the proceeds, laid them at the apostles feet and distributed to each one as anyone had need. We're talking about needy saints. Yeah, Not everyone had need. There were some people who had extra land and had extra houses, people like Barnabas. Barnabas was not a needy saint. Barnabas had excess, so he sold it so that he could take care, so that others could be taken care of. They were not all needy saints. And not to put too fine a point on this, Daniel, but seeing as how this is just an audio podcast and not a video podcast, would you like to describe what you and I look like. Feel free. Don't okay. hold back. <laughs> I am six foot five. You're about six four. I'm six two, six three. I'm shrinking. Okay. I'm getting older. You're, sh you're shrinking. Okay. So a couple taller individuals. I am six Who foot wasn't five. Speaking about our height. Man, Come on. Huh? I wasn't speaking about our height. Come on. Get with well, it. You what do you want to talk about? The fact that we are uh, larger <laughs> individuals. The uh, fact that we are not needy. <laughs> okay. Well, you're we are there, not needy. You're we sitting are... there saying describe us, so I'm sitting there describing us. <laughs> Thank well, you. Yeah. Six foot four Caucasian male. <laughs> I'm not putting it on an six, APV. <laughs> six five. Anyway, we are we are meaty. We're... We are not needy. Yeah. There you go. And so the point is. Does the church, do we need the church's benevolence? Like, no, we're not needy. Acts chapter six speaks about the daily distribution. Was that daily distribution for everybody? No, it speaks about the widows. Yeah. There were widows who were neglected in the daily distribution. Acts six, verse one. Not all saints are needy. When we talk about benevolence, we're not talking about we're not even talking about benevolence for all Christians. We're talking right. about benevolence for needy Christians, right? Right. And so this idea that the church should be charged with caring for unbelievers, that's not true. This idea that the church should be charged for caring for all Christians, that's not even true. It's like, no, there's needy saints and there's saints who are not needy. Yeah. Um. And so we need we need to un, we need to understand that. And people who who want to go down this road, it's like no, the chart the church was never charged 
with with these things. The church was never charged with providing lunches for everybody. That that's not yeah. the church's responsibility. It's simply right. not. When you get up to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the verse you already read, and and go ahead and quote the verse again. If you're hungry, where do you eat? You go eat at home. Go eat at home. That's not the church's responsibility. It's it's just simply not. The church has never has not done that. It, scripturally speaking, uh, I need to say. Um, let's look in the next passage. I, I'd like to look in is in Philippians. In Philippians chapter three, Philippians three at verse verse seventeen. Philippians three verse seventeen. Brethren, join in following my example. And note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. That's important right there because if you have people who say anything goes, what they're really saying is there is no pattern. Yeah. Like, no, there is a pattern. Uh, Verse 18, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. And it's that business right there when it describes these people whose God is their belly and they set their mind on earthly things. All of these things, what are people setting their minds on, Daniel? Carnal, like, worldly, fleshly things, things that were not of God, but of the world. There are probably people who are going to get together whenever the game is tonight. There are probably churches I'd be willing to bet, and I'm not a betting man, where you could go to the church, you could go to churches and watch the World Series. I bet tonight. I remember, I remember living down in Louisiana, and there was a denomination right up the road from us. And every Super Bowl, every Super Bowl, guess where everybody gathered on Sunday night? Right there in the auditorium, or there at the yep. building. They're they're up there in that denomination, and it's like, are we setting our mind on earthly things or heavenly things? Um, again, we, we are not trying to dismiss the needs of the body, but people want to, they want to look at, and and you, and you alluded to it. So they were trying to call that in your, your, um, situation that you described with the funeral. Yeah. They were wanting a luncheon for the family to be categorized as benevolence. Yes. And it's like, you're not needy, (laughs) right? You're not needy and you're not a member of the church either. Life, y'all. And um, so though it needs to be understood what the church's responsibility is. We are not anti-benevolence. That's not what we're saying. We're saying right. who do we take care of? That's what we're saying. There's, um, lim- there's limitations within the church. If somebody if yeah. if you, you or I wanted to be able to help out someone that may that may be in need that's maybe not a member of the church. We have that opportunity and the ability to be able to do that uh, within our within the confines of ourselves, but not so, it, is, it is not a it's not something that the church is required to do or authorized to be able to do. Uh, it is focused on the saints in that. Let me ask you a question about that, Daniel. Yeah, because and I I think this does hold true. As you said, individually, we should be hospitable. Absolutely. But if if there's an institution out there that is, frankly, if there's an institution out there that's doing this work, well, guess what? I'm going to feel less inclined to do what I can do individually. I'm going to say, why don't you go up there and and get your coat from them? You know, go up there and get your lunch from them. I don't want to have you in my home. I'm too busy. So you just go up there to the United Way and they'll take care of you. I don't have time for you. There's different things that happen when we when we start doing offering social programs. First of all, we lose our ability to be able to help out if we're able to at different times. But also churches that want to involve themselves in the social gospel and social programs, they give themselves the preeminence because now they're wanting to make they're making it more of a spectacle of looking at me. Look at what I'm doing. Look at what we're doing. Uh, rather That's than That's pharisaical, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh it we're not allowing our we're not we're 
allowing others to have the preeminence of it. And it goes against what God was teaching when we're being hospitable, when we're being charitable, we don't need to be broadcasting it as well. Uh, it's not, not a matter of looking at me. And that's what these social programs become. I, you know, may not want to admit it, but it is, people may not want to admit, but it is, is that we begin to focus on ourselves and letting us have the, the, the focus on that rather than giving God glory with what we're able to do and not having others have to broadcast it. If someone sees me doing good and they want to talk about it, that's one thing. But what we're seeing is, is that by wanting to have the social programs, by wanting to go about and doing offering food or whatever it may be, we become more of a look at me situation and broadcasting it openly, publicly, and wanting others to basically say, wow, good job, add a boy, you know, we get away from God. Now, let, let's come back to Matthew 5 for a second, Daniel, concerning that yeah. point. Matthew 5, Matthew 6, we're in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Yep. And the person, the naysayer to everything you just said would say, well, wait a minute, Matthew 5, verse 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And they'd say, well, we're just trying to let our light shine. And so yeah. we want people to see our good works. People need to see our good works so that they can praise God. Right? Right. And that's what they'd say. Um, but later on in the same sermon, <laughs> the Lord gives they want, them. They want, they want a Matthew 5, 16. They don't want a Matthew 6, 1 to 4. Because what is that? That's where it's, you know, if you have, if you do charitable deeds, don't let them be seen by others. Do what you can do. Do it in secret. God's going to, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but God is going to reward those who do their charitable deeds, who do their good works in secret. And they're not sitting there, as he points out, we're not sitting there blowing the trumpet. And, and that's, draw literally attention, what the, that's literally draw what the, the Pharisees attention. would do. Yeah. They would literally, he says there in Matthew 6, verse 2, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, Daniel, I'll, I'll ask, and we, we don't mean to step on people's toes necessarily. We're not going looking for trouble, but... <laughs> I don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't know too many people who literally blow a trumpet when they do a charitable deed anymore. No. But what will people do? I believe we have a thing called Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We have our our quick sell our cameras to be able to take pictures and make sure that we're documenting it all, but not document it just for our own benefit. We want to share it with others always. I like to share some things that happen from time to time, but I'm not doing it. You know, some people are just, they have to have it. They have to be in front of the camera. Right. I, I have seen congregations where it sure does look like they have a whole marketing team. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it is, it should cause us to think about this passage. Because we're not against charity. We're not against doing charitable right. deeds. We're not against benevolence. But if people, again, the Pharisees were doing charitable deeds, but they were doing it for the wrong reason. Yeah. They were doing it for the wrong reason. People have different reasons for doing charitable deeds. Another one would be, you remember when is it um when Mary anoints Jesus and all the disciples said, Well, why wasn't this sold and given to the poor? Yeah. And 11 of those men may have had a little more pure motives. Jesus still rebukes them and says, Mary saved this for the day of my burial. But Judas said that because he was a thief and he was only interested in his own belly because he would steal what was put in the treasury box. And a lot of preachers are mercenaries, frankly. And a lot of people who call themselves preachers they engage in certain activities because they're interested in their own belly. Um, yeah. And that's just how it is. That's how it's always been. That's how it's always been. And that's how it will always be until the Lord returns. And I guess we should just like, like Paul, I'm thankful when they actually speak the truth, even though yeah. they may not be, may not have the motives they need to have. Um, I, I want to come up to 
Second Thessalonians now, Daniel. Okay. Uh, Second Thessalonians, because this is this is we're we're gonna look at two passages. Um, certain questions have to be asked when it comes to benevolence, and one of them is found in Second Timothy chapter three. Um, do what? Second Thessalonians. What did I say? Timothy. Second Second Thessalonians. Thank you. I did that last week too. <laughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 3 at verse 10. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. You have seen... You've seen pictures, I've seen pictures, we've seen situations where you have um, cafeteria-style luncheons. And sometimes people will, they've asked me, they've asked me since I've been here in North Ridgeville, well, we need to have, you know, we need to have things like that. You know, we need to have, what what's wrong with everyone just, you know, offering a common meal for us, for who, for the community, for whoever? Well, one of the questions that would have to be asked is, pertains to this passage. Because if you don't work, what what happens? If you, you don't, don't work, eat. you don't eat. Yeah. And so that limits benevolence. Right. If someone is not willing to work, neither shall he eat. And so one of the questions that would have to be asked, even when it comes to benevolence, is are you working? And that's a serious question. That's a serious question. Now, are people going to ask that question? No. Well, why not? Because it's real awkward. <laughs> Frankly, it's because it's an awkward question. Because if the answer is, well, no, then the answer is going to have to be, we'll move on. Yeah. And that's why the, the elders, when we look at benevolence in scripture, and you have benevolence for the congregation, you have benevolence in the case of, um, in Antioch, they sent benevolence to the needy saints in Judea, and they sent it to the elders and the elders would know the congregation. And if someone was not working, then the answer would have to be no. You're gonna you're gonna have to work. Now, if someone cannot work, that's a whole nother issue. If you have uh, if you have a yeah. needy if you have needy widows, it's like that's a whole nother issue. But here, that question, which is called a commandment, has to be respected. If a man doesn't work, neither shall he eat. That right on its own, limits benevolence on its own. The other passage I wanted to look at that goes along with that is 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, it's a whole chapter about widows, and it talks about those who are truly widows, to use the phrase found in verse 3, and then those widows who have family, those widows who have children, grandchildren, such things as that. That's verse 4, and it is the family's responsibility to take care of family. I'm not talking about the church here. I'm talking yeah. about their earthly the physical, family. The physical, yeah, yeah. Is what we're talking about. And it makes this point down in verse 16. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them and do not let the church be burdened that it may relieve those who are really widows. Whose responsibility is it, Daniel? We've already talked about how fat we are, or at least it was implied. <laughs> Whose responsibility is it to take care of your kids? My responsibility as a parent. And whose responsibility is it to take care of my kids? <laughs> your responsibility to take care of your kids. Well, I think you should take care of my kids. Hmm. Why okay. are you giving me a dirty look? <laughs> All right. <laughs> whose responsibility is it to take care of our parents as they become elderly as they are elderly and it's, it's like if, if, responsibility. Yeah. if it comes to that point it's my responsibility to take care of my parents it's your responsibility to take care of your parents yeah now we understand and scripture bears it out there may be emergency situations you know someone may lose a job there may be a famine like in the new testament there may be a fire, there may be an earthquake, there may be a storm, there may be a hurricane. Okay, there may be a need there. Yeah. And so the church is authorized to help in those situations. Right. 
Right. But absolutely. the family, the family should step up, I would suggest first, and not immediately burden the church, even in those situations. Yeah. But here, as it talks about it, when we're talking about um, ongoing care, ongoing, yeah, ongoing care, if if you have family, that's their responsibility. Right. That passage, 1 Timothy 5, limits benevolence. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened that it may relieve those who are really widows. Benevolence is for needy saints who are actually needy. Fair? Fair. I mean, I know that sounds harsh. I know that sounds harsh, but but I do think it's right. It is scriptural. It is scriptural, and we should recognize that it's right. It is it is our responsibility. This passage in 1 Timothy 5, oh, where does it talk about? Let's look at verse 4. If any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. It's good. Yeah. This is how it should be. The church has a responsibility, but individuals also have a responsibility. Daniel, where would you like to go to next? I've been I've been bogarting the passages. You want no, to go right. anywhere particular? Um you think about it. I'll read my last one. Okay. You think about it, and I'm going to read one more passage and then I'll turn it over to you. The passage I would like to read is from James. And it's James chapter 5 at verse 13. It says, is, any, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. One of the sad things that I have seen in Christians' lives is that when they are cheerful, they do not follow this passage. That when they want to have a good time, they'll do everything else but worship God. They will enjoy their, once again, their burgers and their baked beans, and they'll play their board games, Yeah, and they'll watch their football games, and they'll sit out and talk talk about anything under the sun, and it, it, it all focuses on them and their entertainment. When, when we are rejoicing, when we are cheerful, what we should do is give thanks to God and praise God. If anyone is cheerful, let him sing psalms. And I think that is a, I think that's something we need to remember. When we're happy, when when we rejoice, rather than just um, focusing on us, turn the focus back to God, who's the giver of all that is good and perfect, which also comes from James, James chapter one. And so concerning the the food and the entertainment, uh, labor for the food that does not perish. Well, it is more sustaining than burgers and baked beans, I assure you. Where you want to go to, Daniel? You got any well, other passages? Well, you know, you, you kind of made the leeway right into that. So the social gospel, is that what's going to save save an individual? You know, those ideas of ministry and charitable, you know, good works and different types of things, are those what are going to save an individual? Is that what the church needs to be focused on? It goes back to what we were talking about. The, the, you know, what's going to save us is the gospel, not the social gospel, but it's the gospel, the word of God. Romans 16 and 17, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteous of God is revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. That's what's going to save us. It's the gospel message that is going to, that is God wielding his power has shown us what we need to focus on in being obedient Christians and being able to draw someone in to the church. It's a matter of using the gospel. It's not a matter of using, uh, call what for what it is. Call, these are, a lot of these things, they're just gimmicks. They're gimmicks of, of wanting to try to try offer some sort of falsehood. Some people I've I've heard it before, and people from the members of the church saying, "Well, we can do different things as long as we can get them in the door. Then we can preach them the gospel." There's a big point that we have not really touched base with: is that all we need to do is use 
whatever method we can do to get people to come into the door. One of those things, and I'm going to speak, I'm getting, I'm going to get onto my little rant right here for a moment, is that personally speaking, when Justine and I had our first baby, when we had Corrigan, uh, you know, years ago, my in-laws, I love them to death. They are, they're, they're not members of the church. But we have worked on them trying to get them to come. They're they're they're, they're listening. They actually listen to this podcast as well. So Thank shout you. out to them. Yeah, I'm gonna shout to them that. real quick. Appreciate them listening and taking the time to listen to that. And I appreciate everyone doing that. But one of the things that really got after me is the fact that someone said, "Well, we want your we want Daniel. We want your in laws to come to church." And I'm sitting there thinking, I want that too. But here it was, was what you need to do is you just need to kind of coax them and say, you know, your grandson needs someone to hold them during church and you should come to church because that's where you're going to church. And so the mentality behind all this thought process was that, hey, if we get them in the door, then what we can do, we can share with them the good news. We can share with them the gospel and that's going to keep them there. In reality, what that does is it creates a falsehood. We're building up a relationship with someone in the wrong way. And then when we sit there and jerk something away, I'm not saying the grandkid in this way, but say for instance, we're using some one of these gimmicks to draw someone in and we're going to try to do it. And then we say, well, we're not going to offer that anymore. What's going to happen to them, John? They've been deceived in some sort of way. They're not there. Well, they may not be there for the right reason. And they're going to leave. They're not going to be faithful. That it's we're, we're we're not using what we should be using to draw someone in, and that is the gospel. So we use different gimmicks of oh, we're going to use different social programs. We're going to be charitable. We're going to have uh, you know we're going to have a Christmas program. We're going to have trunk or treat right now. We're going to we're kind of going to do what like banks do anymore now or back then. When the bank wanted you to, to to do business with them, they would offer you something. They'd offer you a toaster. Then the next bank, would be, well, we're going to offer you a blender. Then one bank may have said, we're going to offer you TV. Well, then another bank says, we're going to offer you cash. We jump from place to place to place of what's going to offer me the best, and we're getting away from what the purpose was in the beginning. Who's all, what, you know, again, what we're offering to draw people in. And so people have come up with this idea of entitlement, expecting the church to believe and and believe that the church is to be offering these things and it's the person's entitlement to those things or programs. So you no, know, to that analogy you just had about the banks. Yeah. So a bank offers you a free toaster. Yep. And you're like, "Man, I need a free toaster." So you go and you get your free toaster and then the bank down the road is offering you a free waffle iron. Yeah. And so you switch banks. In order for that first bank to retain you as a member, what are they going to have to do? They'd have to match that offer or match it and do something better. And they're going to have to keep up in the ante. Sweetening the deal more and more and more. And I heard a happened? preacher, heard a preacher yeah. say one time, if you get them in there with a hamburger, it's going to take a steak to keep them. Yeah. And, and then it's going to have to take more than that. And the point is you always have to, to add to it. I've known I've known members of the church who would offer their children or their grandchildren and I the par parents will do this and I don't I don't agree with it. You give your kids a quarter to sit there quietly and you're sitting there paying them. You're paying them to get them to behave in church. And lo and behold they get a little older and guess what they start expecting? They start expecting something. Pay a little more. Yeah. And then they turn 18 or 19 and what do they expect? What's in it for me? Yeah. And they expect more. Yeah. yeah, I've known people. It's like, well, my, my children don't come to church anymore unless I take them out to lunch on Sunday afternoon. And so yeah. that's what I'm going to do just to get them to come. They're not coming to hear the gospel. They're coming for the fried chicken afterwards. And it's like, if people aren't coming for the right reason, what, what you start going to is you look back in the old Testament and by the way, what all that speaks to is bait and switch. Yeah. You try to bait people with fried chicken <clears throat> and it's like, oh, all of a sudden, oh, they got to hear a lesson. Yeah. They're not coming to hear the gospel. They're not interested in the gospel. That's don't bait and switch people like that. But, you know, in the Old Testament, when the Lord fed the people with manna and lo and behold, he fed them with manna and it was a test. He says it was a test, by the way. 
and they ended up despising that manna. Oh, this worthless they, bread. Uh, this worthless bread. And they start dropping dead in the wilderness. Joshua and Caleb and the survivor, the, the younger generation, if you will, they cross into the promised land. And what was it that stopped that same day that they crossed the Jordan? The manna stopped. It's like, no, this was how the Lord took care of you. But now the manna stops and, and you have that test. Yeah. Um, but people ought to think about how they treated the manna and they despised that manna. Yeah. They grew, they got to the point where they absolutely hated it. Well, yeah, we get to, get to the point of, you know, we want to get people to come to church and you're bringing them in for the wrong reason. They don't, they're not there. They're not there for coming for, for their own desire, coming for whatever else, whatever other reason or whatever type of entitlement entitlement or offer is being offered. And then what happens to a certain point? I'm sick and tired of coming here. I'm sick and tired of the church. I'm sick and tired because the heart was not in the right place already. And so I it's know, been spoiled. I know someone who visited a congregation coming from a denomination and it was where it's where mom and dad are. Yeah. And mom or dad came up to her and, you know, just introduced themselves and asked where she was from. If she lived in the community, she said, yeah, she lived in the community. She attended the Baptist church around the corner from them. And mom and dad were like, Oh, well, what brings you here this morning? And she was just wanting to get away from where she attended because they were constantly on her to do this or that or the other. It was a program every day. And she was tired of all the stuff. <laughs> and it's like, and that's that's one of the issues that comes up with all this. Daniel, yep. let, let me ask you about an argument people will make because they'll say, well, yeah, but they didn't have stuff like we have today back then. You know, they didn't have all these different programs and, and things like that. So let me ask you, uh, did they have hospitals back then? No. Yes, they did. They <laughs> had physicians, but not like, not like what we think of. Yes. Hospitals. Well, okay, not like a 10-story... They had hospitals. They had places that were known for medicine, right? And my here, here's my point. They had those things. If the Lord wanted the church to be a hospital, could he have done it? Yes, he could have easily done it. He could have put Luke in charge of the hospital wing at the church in Jerusalem. <laughs> he didn't do it. They had hospitals. Did they have games and entertainment back then? Yeah, they had that too. They had the Olympics. They had games. They had those things. Did they have schools back then? Yes. yes. They had schools. So when people say, oh, well, they didn't have stuff like that back then. Yeah, they had all the, they had the same thing we have now. They had it back then. And so then the question is, well, why did the church not do those things? They had the ability to do them. Those things existed, but that's not how the Lord made the church. You right. have to say it was for a reason. It was for a reason. Those things are not the responsibility of the church. The church no. is not in the entertainment business. Absolutely. We again we go back to the gospel. Paul Paul right. what Paul tell Timothy, right. take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who will hear you. That's where salvation lies. That's how we're going to be able to help another soul be saved, not only for ourselves, but others that are willing to hear, that are willing to listen. You know, we look at, uh, you know, another passage is over in Acts chapter 14 and verse 21, where it says, so you got Paul and Barnabas, it says, when they preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples. Some people will look at it and think it's all about the numbers, John. When you look yeah. at some of these different churches that are offering social programs, it's like, wow, there are, you know, for instance, uh, there's one here, uh, 500 people here at this one congregation. Calls them, uh, you know, their church, they, they call themselves a church of Christ and everything, but here it is 500 people. What are they offering? Well, they have all these other different programs as well within everything. What about what, what, what's drawing people to them? Is it the social program or is it through the gospel that many people were being added to the church and were becoming true disciples of Jesus? Again, you know, I, would that, ask that's people, a I would ask people to remember John 6. Yeah, If Jesus wanted to retain those people, he could have easily made more fish and bread. Yeah. He did not. 
and he let them leave. Yeah. Because they were not interested in his teaching. Right. Absolutely. It's it's not it's not the social gospel that draw that should draw people, but rather it's the gospel. The word of God is sufficient and will save those who are willing to hear. Now I I will say, and I don't this may turn into another hour long discussion. <laughs> Again, we're as individuals, we should let our works we should do our good works, let our light shine before men. Yes. And that may involve physical things. Yes. Such we've been talking about. In James chapter two, we might also notice in James chapter two, it says, What is a prophet, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And we do care for people's physical blessings. It's not yeah. physical needs. The work of the church concerning benevolence involves saints. Yes. Individuals, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God. You better pr you <laughs> you better give a cup of water in the name of the Lord though. Right? Sort of like the miracles. The miracles were meant to confirm the message. And the works that we do better accompany the message. You don't just give a cup of water is my point. <laughs> yeah. You, you don't just give a cup of water. There are like, moments that, well if we say that we are to be good and, and hospitable people and being able to help out one another from time to time, we should show it. Yeah. What you're getting at. It's not just a matter of right. just saying that we do, that we should. It's a matter of, you know, there may be times where we cannot physically help someone out uh, with whatever needs they're needing. We right. may not be able to do it ourselves, but that doesn't mean every time we say no. I mean, there may be times where we might be a little more blessed at that moment and we can help someone and we should we should take advantage of such measures of helping one another. And if not, if, if we're not able to, maybe we had to reach out to one of our, someone else that we know that may be able to help. And There's me, ways of being able to make sure that those needs are taken care of is what we're getting at as well. Look up one of the passages. Look up, um, do me a favor, Daniel. Look up one of the passages that talks about hospitable or hospitality. Like okay. One of them is at the end of Hebrews. And I want you to look up what that word for hospitality literally means. Um, because the church, and, and the whole point of this discussion, the church has its work to do. And concerning benevolence, it's exclusive to the saints. Individuals, oh, well, I, individuals have, we have our work to do. I and, got Romans 12, 13 is one of them. Okay. Distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. What does that word hospitality literally mean? In the original language, uh, well, I'm, I'm let, me, let me look that up. Give me a second. What'd you say it was Romans twelve? Romans twelve thirteen. Romans twelve verse thirteen. Let's see. That word literally means to entertain strangers, but it's actually it's actually the beginning of it is the word philo, so it's you know brotherly love. But here, here's my point about bringing that up. That idea of being fond of strangers or hospitable of strangers, it's not even talking about playing games. <laughs> it's, yeah. not, it's not using the word entertain like we use the word entertain today. When we use the word entertain today, we think, oh, come on over to my house and we'll watch the ball game. Yeah. It's not no, this, talking about that. This is taking care of those needs of everything. Yeah. Uh, being able to address whether it's... Uh, Someone needing a little bit of shelter for a little bit, a little bit of food, whatever right. it may be. Exactly. Exactly. Even hospitality. One one of the things we should probably do is is look at what biblical hospitality means versus what we often think of hospitality today. When we think of hospitality today, we think of throwing a party. When we look at biblical hospitality, it was more making room for someone and being with someone. So anyway, just something to consider. Uh, Daniel, you got anything else you want to discuss, want to talk no. about in regards to this? No, I think I, I touched base with everything for the most part. Okay. 
So I think we've dealt with our questions. What is the function of the church? Does the church need these different social programs? Does the Bible authorize these different social programs? And it just doesn't. It just doesn't. No, it does not. Yep. Appreciate you, Daniel. Yep. Appreciate as well. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We hope this study has been helpful for you. And we hope you join us next week for another episode of Looking to Jesus. Looking to Jesus.